Japan was a country that spent most of its history at war. Province against province, warlord against warlord. The struggle for money, land and power was an endless series of battles, allegiances and legend. Armour was perfectly suited to the times, the terrain and the weaponry of the samurai. But how functional is it really? Does it stand up against full contact and live weapons? Keep watching as we put a Taisho quality armour to the ultimate test. the iconic image of the samurai in full battle armour. Often works of art, allowing the warrior to stand out and be recognised on the field of war. But ultimately, it needed to be tough and versatile, allowing for movement and speed. Often worn for weeks at a time, it was hard wearing and easily repairable. Unique practical and designed to withstand the weapons of battle, perfectly suited to the samurai warrior. So welcome to Fanon's Hall Hotel, a beautiful hotel with Japanese gardens over two acres that is open to the public. There is a fantastic air show today as well as many visitors visiting the grounds and we're here to test the armour. The Iron Mountain Armoury has been handcrafting samurai armour since 2005. They offer the most authentic, economical, and customizable samurai armor in the world. They currently offer their armor in three separate classes. The Kachi class, or foot soldier's armor, is for the samurai on a budget. The Kashira class, or officer's armor, is crafted for a samurai who wants their armor ready for battle. The Taisho class, or general's armor, is meticulously handcrafted by the most experienced armorers for the samurai who wants the highest in quality. We used all three classes during our testing, including the tatami armor. The battles on the Japanese plains made full use of samurai cavalry. But for most samurai, the travelling and fighting was done on foot. Once the army reached the mountains and the high fortresses, horses became unsuitable and the real legwork began. This meant weeks or months spent walking, running and climbing while carrying everything that they would need for the battles ahead. Samurai armour therefore needed to be comfortable and flexible and allow the wearer to be able to carry out all of those tasks without hindrance. The armour should allow the ability to climb trees and scan the land ahead. Climb to the mountainous fortifications of enemy strongholds all the while dressed in armour. Once battle commenced, they would need to be able to move quickly and easily while fighting. If knocked down, have the ability to get up and continue the fight. The armour would need to be light enough to allow for this, but tough enough to withstand the treatment. The Iron Mountain armour was tested under all these conditions. Well, after climbing trees, climbing mountains, rolling and fighting. The armour was surprisingly comfortable. It took all of the impacts with ease and no bruising, which is a great success. Can you move in Iron Mountain armour? The answer is yes. Well, we fight on a regular basis at Muso Shuki Ryu and we do not hold back. So to be given some armour to train in, 
was an absolute pleasure and we took it to town. The armour certainly took everything that we threw at it. There was a few scratches and a few minor dents, but they're easily polished out and fixed. An absolute pleasure to fight in. Muso Shugyo would definitely recommend Iron Mountain Armoury as the armour to wear for combat. The Tachi and Katana are both swords worn by the Samurai. Whilst in armour, the Tachi would be hung from the waist with the blade facing down, while the katana, slightly shorter and less curved, would be worn through the belt with the cutting edge up. Despite popular opinion, the sword is not a main battlefield weapon, as it is ineffective against most armours. Think of it as a sidearm for emergency use, and perfect for taking enemy heads. So how effective will a katana be against iron mountain armour. We decided to test this particular Taisho class suit of armor because we've trained with it for over a year in the heat, rain, and snow, making it a lot like a suit of armor a samurai would have worn after a long march into battle. After all of this abuse, we will see if it can still stand up to the ultimate test. So the first two strikes that we're gonna look at is the kabuto, the helmet, and the do, the body. We're going to bring the sword straight down on top of the helmet. Now I'm not expecting it to work. The helmet should absorb the blow. We're then going to move through with a good strike to the chest or the dough. Now this could penetrate. It'll be interesting to find out. Let's see what happens.
Well, we can see that the helmet took the blow exceptionally well. It was dented and it was paint chipped. But there's more going on than meets the eye. When we turn the helmet around, we see that the force of the blow radiated to the back and was absorbed by the laminate, which exploded outwards, exactly as it was designed to. While the dough showed extreme tough protection, it literally got dented and scraped. The wearer in both of these strikes would have known they'd been hit, but would have survived. So we've seen direct blows to the helmet and the body will possibly leave them bruised and concussed. And a sword is quite often very effective for cutting away the cords of the armor. So we're gonna to attempt to cut the cords to see if the Kuzari drop away, and then we shall be attacking three targets. The Shikoro. Now I'm expecting them to absorb the blow, but for the lacing to part and allowing it to fall away. We are then gonna come through with a strike to the most solid part of the Sode, or shoulder guard, followed by attack to the plates themselves. Will the cord hold? Will the armor bend? Or will the sword penetrate? The sword cut through the cords with ease, although it may take several cuts for the armour to fall away. Both the Shikoro and the Kuzari survived well. Dented, some chipping and definitely lace was cut, but the samurai would have survived. Now for me the weak part of the armour has always seemed to be the arm and the wrist. We have quite solid armour on the forearm and just chainmail on the upper arm. I think will probably be okay. A possible broken arm, but not a penetration. But I really think the sword will cut through this chain mail. Well, I wasn't surprised that the strike to the lower part of the arm didn't penetrate. The metal spines would have absorbed the blow but the big surprise for me was the chainmail strike. Not only did it hold, but the sword did not penetrate. A broken arm possibly, but again, we have a samurai that would have survived. So let's look at the face mask or mempo of the samurai. It was worn during battle to protect the cheeks. The nose is detachable because it did often become a hindrance. Interestingly, the longer the moustache, the older and more valiant the warrior was. We are now going to test it with a good strike to the cheek and I'm going to attempt to attack the throat, cut the cord so that it falls away, giving me a perfect strike to the throat. Mempo took very minor damage. I'm sure the warrior would have had a broken jaw. The cords were very easy to cut, exposing the throat for a secondary cut later. I'm really interested in this next strike. We're going to attack the padding under the shoulders. Now this has lovely little hexagon patterns, but within that are small metal discs to help protect the wearer. Will the sword penetrate? Well, the small metal discs in the padding certainly did their job. The sword could not penetrate. The Ryujin sword certainly had a test of its own today. Before we attack the armour, we test cut against a dry bamboo mat, one of the toughest things to cut cleanly. And it went through like butter. And after battering the armour mercilessly, I fully expected it to be blunted. A lot of chips, damage and possible bending. But the sword itself survived perfectly. 
it is straight with a few minor chips that could be polished out. But can it still cut? Well, we found out. We cut again some dry bamboo matting and it went through with ease. Ryujin swords have proven to be swords of quality. The spear, or yari, were characterised by a straight blade that could be anywhere from several inches to more than three feet in length. The blades were often made of the same steel that Japanese swords were forged with and were very durable. The yari is perfect for thrusting and slashing and slamming enemy samurai to the ground and all samurai would be expected to train regularly no matter what rank they were. How will the Iron Mountain armour stand up to the thrusts, slashes and strikes of a Yari spear? The Yari was the primary weapon of the samurai on foot and also on horse. We're going to look at two classic strikes. Yoko Shibaki or temple strike, followed by a thrust to the body. And this spear is designed to penetrate. Let's see what happens. Yoko Shibaki strikes proved to be ineffective against the armour, even though it had already been struck hard by the swords. While the thrusts didn't actually penetrate, they showed that it's very easy to knock a warrior down. There was some severe denting and two of the seams had burst, but the dough is still fully wearable and functional. The Iron Mountain Armoury crafts their armour traditionally using laminated plating. Each plate is designed to flex and absorb the impact. It's versatile, it's flexible, it's repairable. The Yumi bow is exceptionally tall, standing over two meters in height and unique in design and use. Able to be shot from horseback, from foot and from low ground positions, the Yumi was a great long distance weapon, but needed years of skill to master. The arrows are far longer than their Western counterparts and could be fitted with a wide range of arrowheads to devastating effect. Japanese armor had to be able to resist the arrows from penetrating the body. How will the Iron Mountain armor fare against the Yumi bow and arrow? Now the Japanese Yumi bow is unique in all of the world, perfect for shooting from horseback and from low on foot. At Muso Shugyu Ryo we practice battlefield archery and I've shot many targets but this is the first time to shoot into armour. The arrow definitely did not penetrate but it was purely a target arrow. I can't help but wonder what an arrowhead would actually do to this armor. And I've decided to find out next. What a difference an arrowhead makes. I must admit, on a glass fiber arrow, it did throw the aim off slightly to the left, but we had penetration. From 35 feet, we saw it just went in about a quarter of an inch, not killing the samurai. From 25 feet, we managed to get a penetration of about half an inch. But once we moved closer to 15 feet, it penetrated a lot deeper. But as we can see, the samurai would have had a nick and not a kill because it would need to go through at least three inches to finish him off. Once again, the samurai has survived. But 
Well, one thing with me, the armor has survived so well so far, I'd like to give it one more test. The Tanto was often worn with armor and used very in close and personal. Let's see what it does to Japanese armor. Well, we've certainly bent the Tanto, but the armor is absolutely fine. Once again, Iron Mountain Armory. Samurai armor for the modern warrior. As you can see, the Samurai armor crafted by the Iron Mountain Armory holds up to the test. Everything that we put the armor through, through grappling, fighting, sparring, climbing trees, scaling mountains, it standed up to the test. It held its own. And still, the armor works as it's designed to. It's versatile, it's flexible, it's repairable. The Iron Mountain Armory and Ryujin swords are crafted traditionally. They're the most authentic, economical armor and swords on the market today. Of all the questions we are ever asked, the most common, is it really wearable? Can you move in it? Is it comfortable? Is it strong enough for martial arts training? Don't just take our word for it. You've seen it for yourself. The answer is yes. Iron Mountain Armory, traditional Japanese armor for the modern warrior.